welcome everybody to our uh, ongoing Mercy College series um, where we speak with our professors. We're going to tap into their knowledge and expertise about various aspects of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and today we're talking about communications, trust, transparency, humanity, um, and we're all getting a lot of communications right now because we're all stuck at home and we have a lot of information coming at us all the time. And so we're going to talk about how we look at that, what kinds of decisions are being made, how we as news consumers and also as customers um, can react to all the communications that are coming our way. So there are two people um, from the Mercy College School of Liberal Arts who are joining us. Jade Snyder is an Associate Professor of Communications and PR, and Mike Parada is an associate professor and chair of the Communication and the Arts Department, and both, as I said, are in their, our School of Liberal Arts. So thank you, Jade and Mike, for joining us. Let me see if I can uh, bring you up here so people can see who you are. There you go. Um, hi, you can wave, by the way. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you, Jade. Um, as I said, we're getting clobbered with various communications, right? From companies far and wide. This pandemic poses opportunities and also challenges, yes? Absolutely, I mean, like never before. And so we've got, um, we've got information coming in from, if we're employed from our employers, um, as retail customers, certainly that onslaught that comes in our inbox and emails has had to um, increase and, and respond and adapt. We've got what's on television, um, not just the news, but then also what we're seeing with the advertising and the shift. And so the conversations have had to try to respond and adapt. But yeah, it's a really big onslaught right now. Um, so the challenges are how do we as marketers, right, how do marketers respond to that content um, or the concerns of their audiences? And uh, some are doing a great job and some uh, we wish they would be doing a better job. But it's really all about kind of making sure that that content is responsive to the needs of the public and the audiences. And then it's also appropriate for that brand and the brand mission. So what are you noticing? Are, are companies being, like, are there people who are doing it super well and people who are doing it super yeah, poorly? I, I think, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing some great examples. Uh, so there are different categories of, uh, of ways that the uh, traditional advertising agencies, the PR agencies, and then also the corporate uh, communications that are coming from the corporate side are coming out. Right. So we've got that category of great advertising and the ads that we're seeing all across social media, traditional media that are responsive and some some great shining examples of what they're trying to do. Uh, by and large, we're seeing that message for the traditional advertising agencies is to say, yeah, we're in this with you. Um, we recognize that you are a customer, a longtime customer, some, in some of those examples when we have those individual relationships, like our banks, um, when we have those relationships with uh, loan servicers or things like that, those communications have to be personalized and with respect to um, to our needs at this time. I know Bank of America is uh, one of many different banks that were proactive in reaching out, for example, to their customers and saying, hey, you know, if you're having a hard time making these payments, you can, um, with no penalty, uh, sort of forbear your, your credit card payments, which is a really big deal for uh, the, what are we talking about? the millions of people right now who are out of work. Um, but then on the traditional side, brands like Nike, who really, um, you know, are all of the retail brands, especially the apparel brands are taking a hit, um, but they still have their online sales that they can leverage as well. So they're really taking the charge in trying to get on the bandwagon and make sure that everybody is clear about the public service announcements. So um, a lot of the brands that are doing it right right now have for the past couple of weeks been really on the forefront of reminding everybody to stay at home. And whether or not you are a retail apparel brand or, um, you know, bottle service or consumer packaged goods, that idea of advancing sort of the broader message is something that I think the public really is responding to 
well um, because they're not trying to sell, sell, sell at this point. They're trying to say, okay, how do we use our platform to get everybody on board with staying at home? And then how do we make it brand appropriate sort of as a second stage? Um, there are a lot Another of kind of communication though that we're getting, like, I, you know, so in my email box is a message from the CEO of Delta Airlines. Right. And my initial reaction was, why is he writing to me? Right. You know, he doesn't care about me. So there's a risk in who reaches out, right? Absolutely. Well, you know, again, larger corporations have their corporate communications people who um, who, who ought to be making those choices. So uh, unless you are a majority stakeholder in Delta, you probably don't want to hear from the, the CEO. Um, however, if you're an employee, you might. And so, you know, good PR is always looking at those audiences um, and making sure that that communication is specialized um, to the needs of that audience. So as a consumer, or if you fly Delta, or if you have, you know, a zillion miles with them, yeah, you might want to hear about what types of programs they're putting in place to help you stay safe. But should it come from uh, the CEO? Maybe that's not as authentic as it might appear because mm -hmm. whether or not that person is writing it is also a really important thing. And now, of course, in PR, we've always had those platforms, but it's that authenticity right now and that transparency that we're really craving because we want to know who we can trust inside of these things. Okay, so I want to bring Michael into this. Speaking of who we can trust, um, and, and get you to talk a little bit about the news media and how you think they're doing uh, with disseminating information on a 24-7 basis. Well, I think you kind of made it really interesting there when you just said 24-7. The 24-7 <laughs> news cycle opens up uh, a lot of programming that some people don't feel is overly necessary, is overly supportive. And I think that's kind of the first challenge of running a news media is, you, you know, this 24 seven, you have to just keep generating content, creating content. And that's where you get some, you know, pundits having shows. And that's where you get to the point where people having opinions, people kind of not necessarily sending the messages out that maybe all people agree with. And, and that's part of that problem is that 24 seven news cycle. Overall, the country has been actually pretty receptive to the, to the news coverage. Uh, Pew research polls have shown that about 66 to 68% of Americans are not only watching more news than they've ever watched before, but they're actually very supportive. They're either saying it's good or excellent coverage of, of COVID-19 and kind of our country's response to it. So overall, the country's pretty, pretty pleased with, with the type of coverage that they're getting from the media. Um, I think for the most part, we're doing a really good job. Of, of trying to get you as much information that we're able to get to you. We're kind of caught in that trap where people are just so used to immediacy. We're so used to, we, we want the information right away that when the information does not come uh, accurate or a hundred percent, then all of a sudden we turn around and say, well, now we've made a mistake. You know, this person was lying. This person was giving misinformation, but it's just what we've been used to over the past 15 to 20 years that we're just so used to immediate answers. So used to immediate communication that not everything is going to be 100% accurate, especially in the point we're dealing with an unprecedented uh, virus that we've never seen before. The scientists, the doctors, they're, it's not, you know, people are, are coming out and saying, well, this person was wrong, this person, like, they don't know, they're, they're making uh, assumptions and, and they're really doing their best and things don't necessarily always stay true. Science changes from, from the day. And so does the news coverage of who's changing it. So, so overall, um, Believe it or not, the highest rated that um, the approval rating that, that we're getting from the media is actually network television. They're at 68 to 70 percent uh, approval. Only about uh, 12, 13 percent of the nation think they're doing a really bad job. So overall, that's really good. Print media and their respective websites are right behind them at 66 percent. And the local media is in there about 60 percent. So, so you have an overall of 60 percent above for, for really your top three brands. So they're doing the best that they can to get you the information that they can, but just the information's changing. You know, we forget journalists are living the story. This is very rare, very rarely happens. They're actually living the story as it's happening. That, that's kind of one of the few cases, you know, where what's affecting the, the politicians, what's affecting the local businessmen, it's also affecting the media themselves. You know, not only are they trying to fulfill a public service, not only are they trying to keep 
the common man in, in, in their best interest, but they also have a, a publication. They also have a network that they have to pay for. There's also advertisers that they're concerned about messages that, that they're trying to run, you know, audiences that they're hoping come in and, and, and so are watching and supporting their programs. So their advertisers stay around and continue to uh, keep their shows profitable. So local journalism, I'm very, very, very concerned about local journalism because, you know, like we mentioned Nike and those brands, they're able to sustain a time like this. They're able to concentrate on, establishing a relationship and a brand. But now when you turn around, you know, and, 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 you know, those people, they're advertising in, in the major networks and the major publications. But now what happens when you have these smaller publications that are regional, that work out of a township, that work out of a county, and now they're not relying on Nike advertisers. They're relying on the local businesses and, and they're all closed right now. They're out of business and, and they don't want to, you know, pay for advertising for consumers that aren't eligible. So, those are the people I'm concerned about. Those are the ones that are working super extra hard because those staffs have been minimized and they're doing multiple jobs. I, I mean, reading all over, all over the nation, there's newspapers that are running in these small markets with two or three people and they're doing everything where opposed they had 12 to 15 just two months ago. So I think the messages are there. It's how the consumers or better yet, the users want to accept some of these messages where for those, you know, um, you know, politically who don't maybe agree with, things that the politicians are saying or don't agree with what these science are saying. Sometimes the networks are being kind of caught up in that. And, you know, people are blaming the network for the messages that's coming across. Although that was the source who they interviewed. That was the information that they took. I was going to say, it surprises me a little bit about the numbers that you just said, because when we watch during the day, there's all these bare knuckle brawls sometimes between the media outlets and the people um, you know, in government who are, who are telling us how things are. Think about when you attend a, a sporting event. Think about when you attend uh, an outdoor um, festival or carnival and there's a small ruckus and there's, you know, a handful of people who have started an argument, started a fight, and it kind of wrecks the event for everyone. And that's very similar. Not, you know, 80% of this country is not up in arms, but those 10 to 20, 15% who are, you know, um, unhappy with the coverage or unhappy with messages that your um, uh, government is giving you. Those are usually the outspoken people. It's very rare that someone's watching something that says, hey, this network did a great job. Usually um, it just goes unsaid. They accept the message and, and they continue. It's the people who are unhappy that you're seeing on social media, that you're seeing comedy. They're the ones with the message over and over and over again. But nationally polled most people don't feel that way, but they, those people have the, the loudest, the loudest bark. And that's what usually gets me. So I want to say a couple of things because while we've been talking, a few people have come um, and joined us in the meeting. In fact, I'm going to um, oop, let somebody in right now. So what, you're on mute, but if you have questions, there's a chat feature, which um, you can enable and ask questions of um, either of the professors who are with us. And let me do this once again, just again, for those of you who um, joined us pretty recently, this is Mike Parada, who's an associate professor and chair of the communication and the arts department in our School of Liberal Arts. And Jade Snyder is with us. And Jade, I'm gonna ask you a question now. Uh, I wonder if there are comparable numbers that you know about in the corporate, how do, how do people feel corporate America is, is is dealing with this in terms of its messaging and, and engendering trust in their brands or not? Well, you know, it's the expectation, okay? Um, and as Mike mentioned, uh, the, the immediacy of the news cycle is something that we've come to also expect out of our brands and our corporate communications, um, which is a bit of a challenge for a few reasons. Number one, um, the time it takes to curate um, a communication platform has to do with a lot of things, um, you know, sp specifically what are the marketing objectives? What is the mission of the company, right? So how do those messages align with the mission of the company? And then how do they respond in real time right now to what it is that they want to do to contribute to this, this effort, whether it be uh, to announce their uh, alliances with donation for relief or just to reinforce messaging uh, for public service or or just to kind of align uh, with different ways that they can help us. But that also is kind of a calculated platform in and of itself, because these are for-profit companies that we're talking about. And so that messaging is important. However, it takes a little bit more time to kind of calibrate that appropriately. Now, 
um, and I want to get back to this, we also have social media, which is as immediate as it is in the news, um, in our real time uh, social media platforms for the brands as well. But it's the expectation of that immediacy um, that we're seeing in the numbers. We've got a poll of 800 um, people at at just this past week, um, looking in the first week of April, who expect um, 83 percent of those people have res responded that they actually expect um, brands to come out with some type of communication. So there's a really high expectation that no matter what it is, that you'll at least acknowledge that this is an issue, right? Um, when you're getting emails from you know, the vast majority of companies that are saying, hey, we're aware that this might be impacting you, or hey, we just want to respond to you right now to acknowledge, you know, what we're doing in our own company, whether it impacts you directly or not. Um, at least that's some sort of message, that's some sort of update. Um, if brands are still sort of just forging ahead with their spring, you know, spring sale events, uh, that's going to seem disingenuous. And so we are going to have a negative reaction to that. Don't forget, it's how these brands are making us feel right now that are that's going to affect their bottom line when we come out of this. And so the memory that we have and, and the trust that we're placing in them to keep us updated, but also help kind of guide us because to some degree certain brands and we keep bringing up nike but you know one one great example uh just came out with uh, burger king did this fantastic campaign that was um called couch potatoes right but they're calling themselves couch patriots because they are uh advancing this stay at home right and they even changed their logo the stay at home offer now that's a beautiful elegant execution but even if you are a local company um, or a local delivery service and you're communicating to me ways that um, you can give get me food in my house, which is a big issue for some of us in this region, right? If you can get, get me to be able to feed my family in a safe way, that's something that's going to go so far beyond. So the 80% of those people are looking for that um, guidance inside of this crisis. And brands, it needs, it needs a minute for them to kind of rally around what their communication platforms are going to be and then so, um, you there's know. two things you said that are interesting it's not what they're selling it's how they're making us feel right right yeah I mean that that's that's really what it is we're in the business of persuasion in advertising marketing and PR um, and also truth right because uh, we uh, as as consumers and, and citizens especially in this age we are finely tuned to uh, you know, kind of that meter that tells us whether something is authentic or inauthentic, and we're looking for that all the time. We're trying to filter those things out. Um, a great uh, um, Edelman, which is great national uh, international PR firm, the CEO in 2018 put out this trust barometer scale, and it was really a timeline that showed in the past 20 years how we have evolved in terms of our distrust for certain large corporations, even politics um, and uh, government authorities. And so evolving that trust in a PR, um, in a PR environment is very much about making us feel confident by telling the truth, right? But then also helping to advance, you know, helping to advance an agenda that hopefully will impact us all positively. Now, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say whether you are an employer, right, or a consumer, those messages are equally as important. And the importance, I think, that we're having now, on just like a news cycle, brands are being looked to to modify and update uh, that guidance as well as we go. And so repeated updates, you know, to the point where we're saying, well, I haven't really heard from, you know, that company in a while. I wonder if anything's changed. So we're almost getting to that point where we're expecting those updates in, in a news way. Um, I'm watching, uh, I think it was Jimmy Kimmel the other night, and he was talking to a first responder, a nurse who herself had developed COVID-19 and was um, sidelined at home and recovering. And in his show, he gave her a $10,000 um, gift certificate from Postmates right. to deliver her lunch, you know, and then, but wait, there's more. He gave every nurse on her hospital floor $10,000 worth of um, meal delivery from Postmates. Right. That's the kind of thing you're talking about, right? It's right. just, 
Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I was all warm and fuzzy when I exactly. heard them do it. And, and what comes to mind when you're thinking of food delivery right now? Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's, that's exactly what it is. The, 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 um, again, we're in the crowded message environment any, any day anyway, right? So that onslaught. And so for brands and marketers, it's always about trying to break through that clutter anyway to have share of voice. Um, but aligning yourself right now with, um, what I guess we're calling sort of this ethical kind of do the right thing, you know, so brands, we're counting on brands to do the right thing. And when they do, we're, we're, that's going to resonate with us well beyond um, when we are sort of um, through this, this part of the storm. But like, for example, um, Parade Magazine listed 125 sources um, where you can get free online streaming videos of workouts, right? We're doing it um, even at Mercy College. We're offering that kind of stuff. But Equinox, um, who is renowned for really high rates, you know, it's kind of like this luxury service. All their, their, their stuff is streaming online. Orange Theory, which is sort of a cult classic. So like looking in those categories where you can really make a difference and impact people. Peloton, um, which also is sort of in that luxury um, fitness category has offered their platform for 90 days for free. So anybody who wants to go online, you don't have to have the equipment or the bike, that kind of stuff that can help people make that connection. And again, if anybody who does work out, or even if you're not, once you get into a routine, that's a really important thing. So when this 90 day trial is over, how likely are they going to be to stay with that service? And so it's kind of a win-win, but it's also the right thing to do. Um, so Michael, do you think, I mean, when I listen to the numbers you shared with us before, is it possible that news outlets might actually improve the trust factor um, as the result of how they handle this? You know, that it's, it's kind of difficult to say right now. I think it's some parts, in, in, in some respects, people are, and, and, and this is not because of the situation, it's just the way that they consume news. Some people go for a certain message. And if they get the message that they want, then they're happy. If they don't get the message that they were expecting or that they, they agree with, then, they, then they're unhappy. So for both of those sides, you're, you're probably not going to do any type of convincing. I'm hoping that the people who really didn't regularly pay attention to news and are actively seeking a, 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 the, a message and are actively trying to learn about it and go in without judgment, I think they may find that with some of their own research and with, with some of their own patience, um, that there is a trust factor. I, I think the media has to, has to improve a lot of ways. And, and I think this situation certainly has kind of woken them up to it. Um, pretty much at this point, if you're watching a video cast, you, you, you really, they really need to really do everything to send users to, to their respective websites. So there, cause there you can link to all the information at this point. If, if you don't believe what we're saying, here's a link to the report. Here's a link to the interview that we did. At this right. point, you have opportunities for full disclosure, and that's where the transparency comes in. This. At this point, there's a lot of being able to, you know, and that, that's up to the responsibility of the user where, you know, if you're just watching the, the, the television and you're just taking the four to five minute pieces at, at what they were, there's a lot that goes into that. You know, there's a lot of information that don't get into those small little pieces, those little broadcasts. And at this point, well, you have to show everything, which is really we've been slowly doing over the past couple of years with stories with links and, and printing document, you know, linking documents. But in the past, we weren't really sure if people even wanted that. Did people even want to do their own research? Did they, did they want to spend the time? Or were they, were they more to the point of you just present to us the information, we'll kind of make that decision whether we agree with you or not. Here's an opportunity to really not only test the media, but to test the public. Are you right. so sure of your facts? Are you so sure of your stance? Well, here's your opportunity to now take the same sources, the same information that we have, and you do your own research. You, you know, and that's why it's really important at this point, as much as news as we're all watching, you have to also read the news. It's so important because there you can go and find those sources. You can kind of go down some rabbit holes over, okay, here's how they got there. Here's where we were. So I think that's one of the ways that the media is, is going to come out of this People who want, you know, who, who are willing to accept the message that they're trustworthy. You're also going to see a lot of sidebar stories that occasionally have popped up in the past, but you're starting to see now where not only are we doing a story on, on the COVID situation, but you're seeing these sidebars, why we did this or how we got there. Kind of, we're going to peel the curtain back and say like, 
this is it's kind of like the making of you know you watch the making of a movie you know and you see kind of the behind the scenes you're starting to see that with with news stories there the new york times actually has a reader center where now they're doing um stories about how they made the story what was the discussion like in the newsroom what were the who were the sources were difficult to get who were the sources that that we couldn't get and so i think you're and users enjoy that. You know, the audience likes to see like what goes on behind the scenes. And, and for the really first time, I think the media has to share what were our challenges? Why did we do this? What did it mean? Why, did, why was this an issue in the newsroom? Why we wanted to do these things? So, kind of like a masterclass, right? Absolutely. absolutely. And you're seeing it all over. And you usually see it for, for stories that took outlets months to produce. But now you're going to start seeing it. This is kind of the advice in media circles. Start sharing with your audience why you felt this was important coverage. You're also seeing for the, you know, something that we need, we always as journalists needed to improve on. And you're starting to see it a little more. We're starting to tell you when we don't know things. You mm -hmm. know, in the past, we would just give you the facts that we know. Well, at this point, journalists are now starting to learn, well, you know, we're, we're unaware of, of this information. We don't know it yet. The scientists don't know it yet. The do and, and I think that, holds a little more um, water with audiences. We're saying, okay, you, so you don't know. And I think that's important for us to share as journalists. You know, you can't pretend to be all seeing and all knowing. If you don't know the information, share it with your audience. Sometimes information is impossible to know. Right now people say, well, he, they said, don't wear the masks. And they said, wear the mask. You know, right now, <laughs> all this hysteria. They, they, they told us not to do this. We didn't know. We, we, we didn't know, you know, research and studying. There's people working 24 seven scientifically trying to figure out what this is, what we thought it initially was that's change. And it's going to continue to change what we think it is today is not what it's going to be in a week from now. Treatments that we're hoping for, you know, it, it's, it's a constant flow of, of, of give and take and trial and error. And that's unfortunate to say in a time when people's lives are at stake, but we, we, we don't know. We, we and that's part of the transparency part of it too, right? We're just going to be, honest about that absolutely and it's you know it's so hard with 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 the time and research that stories like this demand um and you don't have that because you you don't want the answers like you want the answers now and when we don't have the answers now you're still expecting something it's a 24 7 news cycle you're still expecting an answer so what do we know sometimes what you know and you give to your audience is, is, is not acceptable. They, they, they want more, but sometimes those answers just aren't there. You know, it's, it's one of the strangest times to do a story because never before have you had more access to sources because your home, their home, <laughs> you, I mean, it's the story of a lifetime and, and, and you can find sources like never before. Yet at the same time, you're trying to say, how am I going to keep the lights on? Because now we also have to run a business and we also have to keep, you know, our advertisers, you know, on board with us. We also have to keep, keep uh, faith in our public. Telling, you know, th th there's also an another concern here, which we haven't addressed yet, is there's also, you know, with some of the information, how much truth does it take to the audience to frighten them, to scare them? And that's some of the concern here. Do we want to petrify our audiences? Do we want to scare our audiences? And some media outlets, you know, in, in discussion said, like, maybe we've gone too far. Maybe we haven't gone far enough. You know, the truth is fabulous. The truth's a wonderful thing. We all want the truth and the facts. But sometimes when the audience hears those truths and hears those facts, they, they, they go into a panic mode. You, you don't want to turn this country into a panic frenzy. We're, we're at uh, um, a high threshold as it is right now. We're at a high limit of where we're at right now. Yeah, I was just wondering if that ship sailed already. I mean, we're all stuck at home with nothing to do but watch and the news is you know, one story and, and, and it's very it, uncertain. It could be worse. It could get worse very quickly. You know, if, if you have an energy crisis, you have, if, you know, so, you know, a gasoline shortages, you have what, you know, things can, can really snowball into some dangerous facts. And a lot of times those things come from the panic of just hearing the facts of the situation and overreactions. So it's really delicate where at point, you know, we have these facts, we want to get you this information, but, can that do damage? Can that right. do many times in journalism history, you know, the Pentagon paid their times. We gave you the facts of the situation and long-term it actually did more damage than it did. Short, did right. short. I want to talk about where your worlds intersect because Jade, there are companies with PR firms who are pitching stories to the news people to try to get them to do right. Right. No, absolutely. Uh, you know, 
again, that intersection, I think that sort of gray area of gray also exists in social media as well. So, and we can talk about social media and that kind of intersection as well. But, it, you know, in order to get sort of the press to pick up these philanthropic e efforts, right? You know, why go through all of this um, to design a way to give back or, you know, put, put all of this money as a marketer into this if nobody's going to pick it up? Um, so, it, you know, that's a really important part of, of the PR ob obligation as well is to um, be, uh, again, humane, trustworthy, strike the right tone, but not um, offer something that's supportive now. And I think that that's more, more than anything to try to help balance because the news, you know, can be scary. <laughs> and, and, and so is it our obligation at this point uh, tonally to try to dial that in a little bit more of that humanization? Because, you know, yes, of course, we're bound to the facts, but we're bound to the facts of any one corporation, right? And understanding, so we're understanding and responding to sort of public sentiment in a very different way than the news outlets do. Um, so, so perhaps there's that opportunity for synergy to say, okay, you know, at this point, maybe gain a little bit of that trust back that corporations have lost. Um, right you know, in the past 20 years, very, you know, for obvious, obvious and important reasons, but to say, okay, this might be our job to step in and say, okay, we can't fix what the news and the facts are, but maybe what we can do is kind of blunt the, the edges and just give you a little bit of something to believe in to kind of take you through this next level. And so that's, you know, in, in, in a great way, that's the positive opportunity of PR to pitch stories that, you know, bring back the humanity, bring phil philanthropy um, back into the discussions as well. Um, is this a time com for companies to, is, is there an opportunity for innovation right now? Absolutely. Um, it, it more, I, I would say more than ever before. And uh, again, this news, you might have read about it in the news because that's where you're going to hear about it is, uh, you know, so, so the maker of Dyson um, has re- sort of like within I think 10 days was able to uh, manufacture uh, and start to produce ventilators. Yeah, uh, that's right. And, that's right. So it's not only a, a time, I think just at a time where at a time in history where that type of innovation is going to help us move forward to another level of society. I mean, that's my personal opinion, but you know, in terms of innovation around, look at some of those alcohol brands. I know that Tito's Tito's was, you know, had to go public and say, no, 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 you can't use our stuff as hand sanitizer. The alcohol level is, <laughs> um, which, you know, everybody's like, okay, I guess we'll just have to drink it, you know, <laughs> go back to that. But instead other companies that distilled small distilleries have been able to pivot, um, for example, and they've been able to innovate and say, well, you know what, we have a higher level of alcohol, why don't we then turn into hand sanitizer? And so they've actually started to do that. So innovation in terms of manufacturing, what can we do to pivot? Um, you know, some of the large, large clothing brands that are out there, corporations that then pivoted and started to, to produce masks. Um, they know that they're going to be taking a hit uh, retail wise. So why not try to turn these things into a humane uh, narrative? And, you know, we all recognize in PR and marketing, it is narrative, right? And so how do you want to be perceived when we're finished with all of this? Innovation. Um, I want to ask both of you, I'll start with you, Jake, because uh, we're right here. Are you, you're, are you teaching online right now? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and so does all of this make for a good case study for your students? It is a living case study uh, that changes every day um, and in so many ways it's been illustrative to the point where my original lesson plan in one of my courses I, I just kind of you know really cut back on it and said okay you know this is it feet to the fire here we are now so let's report you know every week we're checking in on brands that are you know doing a great job brands that could be doing better so it's it's this type of crisis communication um, you can't design these case studies because they're being built right now right and we can look historically to other examples of um, um, but why not just look to the way that they're doing it now and modifying it now? Because we have to judge it in context of everything that we know that's happening right now in the world. And so it's a great opportunity to judge a situation in its context. Um, Michael, what about you? Yeah, I'm, I'm teaching a, a, a few classes online. And um, 
and it's going well and and it's good to see students faces and 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 listen routine is is kind of I think for a lot of people, we needed a little bit of a routine in, in this situation because without it, you kind of get lost and you get trapped into, you know, um, a, you know, there's, there's news obsession, there's communication obsession at some points where you just keep seeking answers and you keep seeking information that, you know, sometimes the best kind of communication is to remove yourself from the situation. And, and, and that's kind of what I tell the students, you know, we're meeting every week and I say, listen, get some air you know, turn everything off, you, you know, the, the, the 24 seven communication and, and you're just seeking, like, sometimes you, you have to walk away from it. You have to give yourself a, a break and a rest. And I think some of the classes we've, we've changed what we were going to do. I mean, the, the, the COVID situation, you know, we, we, you know, especially the news oriented classes, we, what's going on, how, how are they covering it? What can we do to cover it? And in some of my other classes, we're going about it as business as usual. And I think, for those classes, those students are a little relieved that, okay, here for the next two and a half hours, I don't have this, 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 this looming issue on my head. I can actually focus on something else and, and it's a little refreshing. So, so just like companies and news outlets are getting more creative, teachers and professors have no choice. We're getting creative in how we're doing things too. Uh, certainly not doing things, you know, if you had said, you know, bring all your classes digitally two years ago, I would have done it certainly differently to how I'm doing now because of the situation that we are in. Right. You, so, your students have a story right in front of their eyes. Absolutely. You're, you're living. And some of the students are actively involved in it. Listen, students have, you know, family and friends who have the virus. Students have friends who they're going out there. They're still working. You know, they're, uh, they're, they're the ones that are stocking your groceries. They're the ones that are ringing you up as cashiers, you know, they're the one driving trucks, making these deliveries. So this is not the situation where you're studying a disaster from, from afar and, and you don't really, really understand the concepts. Uh, you know, here you, you're in it, you know, right. and everyone is affected, which is just really interesting. Um, I want to hold on to a minute. I want to remind everybody in the group, if you want to ask questions, just write them um, in the chat box there and I can relay them on to um, professors Parada and Snyder. Um, yeah. I, I want yes, to go ahead. Go ahead, Jake. To dovetail on that because one of the other things that um, we're doing, as Mike was saying, you know, this is that living, breathing exercise. Um, yeah, some of those classes, it is refreshing. And I noticed that too, Mike. I've been seeing that myself with the students who are, you know what, it's just business as usual. We're just, you know, I teach creative advertising and we're making ads, right? Because that's a creative outlet and it's something that's really useful. The other course that I, one of the courses I teach is a capstone and we run it like a simulation, simulated communications agency. And one of our clients happens to be our very own department. Um, and so we feel like the Department of Communication and the Arts has an obligation to our Mercy community to be able to respond to that. And so, you know, in that class, we've got students who every week, and we're going to do it this afternoon as well when we, when we jump on um, and, and, and brainstorm, how can we bring positive messages to our community and the broader community? community right now um, and how do we respond to what's going on right now so everything that we had sort of lined up um, obviously the mission is still there but how do we leverage that mission to now be responsive in real time and and students are seeing that right now we're putting stuff out you know and and we're trying to really respond to it so it, it's in so many ways it's such a teaching moment and unfortunately it's such a teaching moment yeah yeah um, I want to, I have a question from Mike Zerilli. I teach communication processes and was wondering if Mike and Jade think that the COVID-19 crisis will change the way we communicate going forward and follow best practices with regard to crisis communications. I, I think so. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think, you know, if you think about how the world was before 9-11 and then after 9-11, you know, culture changed a little bit, society changed, there were certain things, you know, and I don't think we're ever going to go back to the standard norm of how things were even two, three months ago. There has to be changes. Um, there are certain routines that we're not going to be able to get back into. There's already people saying like, you know, I was reading an article saying, you know, we're not shaking hands now. Why did we ever even shake hands? Why, why were we ever even spreading germs? So maybe that comes a cultural issue where we, we don't do those things anymore. Um, Maybe there's a, a, a more of an emphasis that regardless of whether you have a physical presence and, and that you regularly meet with people, maybe, oh, I think a lot of people didn't have a digital backup to say, hey, if we weren't meeting in the office every week, how are we going to communicate? Oh, well, just get an email. I, I, 
an email chain or a text chain, I think at this point, all of a sudden, it has to be worked into all models that, you know, you don't want to be stranded on a desert island, so to speak, just in case if, you know, you're, you're shot out of your office. How can we instantly get together in a Zoom situation? I think a lot, you know, a lot of people probably never had been on a Zoom meeting before. A lot of people <laughs> have been on a video conference before. Uh, yeah, I count myself as one of those. Right. And now all of a sudden you, you're, you're on them two, three times a day. And it's not just to see... Um, your coworkers, it's to see your friends, it's to see your family, you had Passover, you had Easter, you had all these holidays. And, and you know, you see people eating dinner with screens or other people are eating dinners. <laughs> it's in a sense, but you know, people still want that family connection, people still want that communication. But, you know, now the methods of things, you know, people had these screens and talk like, Oh, I would never use that. I would never need a video uh, Alexa. And now, you know, now you can't, you can't get them because everybody mm -hmm. wants them. So I think it will change to that question. I think all communication models change over time and certain situations force you into a change. So I think some things will revert back. I think most things will revert back, but there's going to be some parts of our communication as a society that, that I think will change and, and you may never see. It. I, I, I would second that. I, I think, you know, as far as crisis communications go, um, we, we will soon be, like we were in 9-11, as Mike said, we're going to be in a post-COVID world, right? And so um, having a new reference point, and it's unfortunate that, you know, we, we have a lot of those in just in this past couple of decades, right? We were in, in our region, we were in a post-Sandy world. Um, and I remember back then we had to pivot. And, you know, I, uh, in, in the industry, I was still working actively on clients. And you know, we had these very sort of rudimentary video chats and stuff like that. So I would say, you know, from the infrastructure level for crisis communications and companies to answer that question, um, yeah, we want to make sure that we have access to our colleagues so that all stakeholders that are involved in making choices and decisions can do that um, freely as if we were in a boardroom together, right? Um, so that's number one, because you don't want to leave somebody out of a critical communication and then go ahead and go public with it and, you know, have, have that come back at you. Um, I also think then as sort of a society in this post-COVID world, um, again, those expectations have been set. We've got 83% of the people saying we expect to hear something about this. Um, and then the move to say that if we are, if we approve of what we're hearing, our sentiment toward purchase or engagement with that brand or company is going to increase, right? Um, and so those crisis communications make or break how, how we're moving forward. And so if that expectation that bar is set, I can't imagine it going back to that sort of sense of disillusionment that we've had for the past 20 years, right? In terms or, of- Or even disinterest in some cases, right? I mean, just yeah. like, yeah, it's an ad, right? Exactly, sort of that, that, that banner blindness that we've been having. Um, again, you know, ads are gonna go back to uh, being silly and making us feel good and all of that stuff um, eventually because that's the job of the very traditional advertising. But in terms of communications, crisis communications from companies, especially where there are stakeholders that are, you know, very much involved in it, right? Amazon, they need to be transparent about everything they're doing. We're so reliant on them as a, as a country right now. Um, so, so they need to be correct in their communications. They need to be fast and transparent. Um, so that's the expectation that's been set and I think I hope that that continues. Um, I have another question um, and I hope I'm going to pronounce your name right. Haja Davidson. Um, have college students been actively involved and engaged in online learning? I'm a high school teacher and would like to know. So what do you see, Jade? Are they, in, are they engaged and involved? You know, I, I have seen that. Um, you, prior to our shift to online, a lot of what I did uh, was a move toward paperless anyway. Um, you know, I think that if students are used to, to some degree, that model, I have been getting reports from not just myself, from my colleagues, that um, it's, number one, a lot easier to show up for a Zoom meeting <laughs> than it is to get on two buses and a train, you know, to get to, get to uh, campus. So, um, so for students showing up, I've seen pretty great engagement. I just had a really, really great session um, right before this, this meeting, and um, attendance has actually never been better. <laughs> so and the learning experience itself the learning um, experience, is good 
Yeah, well, it, again, it's, it's about modifying uh, the, the pedagogy based on what the lesson is. And so, you know, being a little nimble with the way that you are about to do something, because there's not a one-to-one -one port, right? So what might have been a group brainstorm in, you know, and, and breakout sessions and things like that, if you're not used to using a platform that's going to allow you to do that, it's going to become weird and kind of like clunky, right? However, if... Um, if, if you are, can modify that and still get that same energy up with people participating, being nimble to be able to shift from audio to chat and kind of like using everything that's available to you, I've still seen that energy. Um, I, I can still see that energy and that engagement. And then, of course, there are always going to be students who are less inclined. Um, you know, we obviously live in a region and a student body that has wide disparity in terms of their connectivity, which faces its own challenges. But by and large, I've seen good engagement. Um, I know my sixth grader, they, it's like it's like nothing ever happened. They're, they're in there with their, with their chat rooms and the students and the teachers. Um, so it could be good you know, if you can be a little nimble, and of course, if you have the access. Right. Um, here is a question from Samantha Karpilov. Um, what are some indicators that a company is doing a good job communicating what is going on to their audiences? Um, and, and Mike, you might want to jump in on this. Um, she says, I'm thinking about this from the perspective of students looking for internships or jobs at specific companies. How these companies communicate at this time says a lot about them and may change students' minds about who they want to potentially work for someday. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you have to understand this about what's going on right now. Very few companies are actually going to come out of this situation financially profitable. You know, and, and right now, those are decisions being made. Right now, it's what can we do to not only, you know, um, not lose a lot of money, lose a lot of profit, but that's really not the aim of a lot of companies right now. They are, they're aware of this. They know that they're not going to have the profit margins they've had. They know that they're not going to have the sales. I think that the goal is, you know, profitability is one issue, but they realize they're going to take a financial loss. So the, the goal is let's make a relationship with these consumers and let's prove to them that we actually do care that we are not the stereotypical company that just only counts the money and can care less about, you know, the people who use it. So I do think people are taking a look at these companies that are coming out and making these self-sacrifices because that's part of what being a company is. You, you have this responsibility to the public to take care of them in a situation. So I think people will take a look at these companies. People say, Hey, you know what? Next time I need to go buy, a, it's not going to pay off for you right now, but in six months, a year, when you're going to go buy a vacuum cleaner and you need that vacuum cleaner, you're going to say, you know what? But I remember Dyson turned around and I remember they did that. So, you know, what? I'm, I'm going to purchase from them when you're at, at, you know, running a family party and you're going to cater from a local delicatessen or a pizzeria. And you're going to say, you know, I remember seeing that, that story that that local deli donated X amount of sandwiches to mm -hmm. the healthcare workers. So, you know what? They've earned my business. Right. And, so does and also business. from our students, Mike, might they have an opportunity to sort of evaluate how these companies do this so that they can think, you know, I really want to work for Dyson or I really want to work for Postmates. Well, you know, I think that comes back into the question earlier. It's related to how are students doing with online learning? Well, here's a funny thing. Right now, what needs to change is life skills digitally need to change for, for students because, you know, a lot of them are fantastic at running these apps and, and these pictures and these social media platforms, but they're really behind in other things that they can do digitally. Maybe they don't know how to research as well as they can do. Maybe they don't know how to really survive. You know, at some points we had people who have, you know, all types of technology, but they really couldn't even, you know, getting into the Zoom was a task. Getting into Blackboard was a task. So, they need to, students need to improve. Everyone needs to improve. We, we maybe, we're not really using the capabilities digitally. Now, will that help with the cust with, with what companies they want to work with? Well, that comes down to, are they willing to take the time to look into what these companies are doing? You know, um, I want to, I want to, we only, we have just a couple minutes left, but I want to ask something to both of you because Steve DeRosa, who's a colleague of both of us, just pointed out something very um, important. Yes, companies are making gestures that are making us feel good when they, when they donate to charities or give $10,000 to a nurse in the front lines. How much are we and should we evaluate them on what they're doing to keep their workers employed? Good point. Um, that can, can Go I, ahead. Yeah, no, I, I can tell you, um, you know, I'm, 
definitely surveying a lot of uh, former colleagues, existing colleagues. My husband's industry uh, is still in uh, advertising and marketing as well. I think that that's a really great question, Steve. And what what we're looking at is, um, yeah, if losses are going to be part of it, um, what was it? And I'm, I'm trying to remember the company now who just announced uh, 4,300 layoffs via email, <laughs> right? Not the way to do it. And so, um, and, and again, I wouldn't want to misspeak about what company that was. It's just not coming to mind. Um, however, if you are a stakeholder, right, and you are ill and we're going to take care of you or give you, you know, I know that Instacart was ready to strike, right? The workers were ready to strike because they couldn't even um, be provided, uh, not even much less hazard pay, but they weren't even being provided the kind of um, uh, personal protective equipment that they would want to go into uh, grocery stores, right? So that's a big deal. Um, so treating these people well, even if, um, I know some companies are taking uh, everybody across the board from the way top to the bottom or taking a 20% pay cut across the board to get through the time to have to reduce layoffs. Um, you know, those types of things um, at, at every corporate, corporate level are going to be decisions that they have to make to say, I have to put, um, as a company, part of our mission is putting uh, the people who are employed for us first. Right. Arguably a good PR move too, right? Yeah, that becomes a new story. And so again, and, and, and then it gets the kind of uh, affinity in the hearts and minds of these people who would patronize them, but also would be employers, right? And to, to Mike's point about uh, improving those soft skills among our students to get them up and running with technology to get them, you know, involved, but also to think about sort of the value system of the, we're, we're in this, now we're teaching the late kind of millennial, uh, mid to late millennial, early Gen Z generation who are very finely tuned to a company's mission. And so it's completely tied to that mission of the company um, and to, to make sure that they have you know, a customer for the next 10 years based or an employer who is going to make a choice based on those, those values. And so alignment with values has never been more important. I want to ask you guys one final question about online learning, which comes from Richard Medoff, who is also a colleague of ours. Ooh. Part of the problem with online communications is you lose the connection. As someone with a PhD in theater, Presence is one of the elements you cannot get online. It's the difference between seeing a photo of a painting and being in the presence of a painting. So he asks the question, how can we use the medium in a way that can translate that experience? That's a great question. I mean, that's a great question. And, and I guess, again, to, to your point about creativity and innovation, um, it's about trying to figure out, uh, we as teachers, how to expand that toolkit. Um, you lose the connection, I would agree, but to a degree, right? Um, because if you're in a discussion board and everybody's commenting on everybody else, um, even if you can't see them, uh, you're, you're feeling a presence. So that's one way, right? And again, there are many uh, many, many different ways to innovate that type of teaching experience, but you can do as much as you can through video and it's never going to replicate that human connection, right? How many of us need a hug right now? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, so, so if we think about it in, in context of that, you're never going to get that 100% connection, but we can do our best um, to try to replicate the spirit of the pedagogy right by trying to foster students to talk to each other we don't have to be the single moderators in the room that students can self moderate and moderate each other and kind of go back and forth in that discussion and then we can use those discussions to bring the humanity back into the discussion and then use that energy to go forward with the teaching I hope that doesn't sound too abstract, but... No, it doesn't. Mike, we just got a couple minutes. Any final thoughts from you? Well, just on that, I mean, we also have to remember we are not distance learning right now. We're crisis learning right now. We, right. We, what we're doing right now is, is not going to be the model of, of how we do it into the future. There's so many other factors playing. I mean, you know, can families, can, can they pay for internet because they've been laid off of work? I mean, so right now, I think we see what's going now. Right now, this is kind of our trial run over how we're going to improve this model. But I think it's very important moving forward. I agree. The, the interaction is so important and the presence is so important. And I think the key is 
You can't let a student unclip their camera and hide off. You don't know what they're doing the same way when a student comes into the classroom and they put their head down and they're on their foot. Students can get just as easily distracted as, as what they're doing in a classroom as being away. So I think you have to let them be spontaneous, let them be on camera, let them see each other, let them feel each other, let them appreciate each other. So just one final thing, you know, just changing a subject. We talked about, the, you know, um, how people were supportive of, of certain medias, you know, I didn't really get an opportunity to talk about social media, social media, the other way, that's probably got the lowest approval rating. You know, you're at 30 to 35% of people completely dissatisfied with news coverage from social media. But I think a lot of that has to do with those are not news outlets. Those are not trained outlets. You're seeing citizen journalism or citizens talking about something that we call in the industry news diffusion. It's like a game of telephone. They've seen a piece of the news and then they go out and they report and they say, Hey, everybody, look what I just found out, you know, without any sources, they're kind of not giving you the whole story. And I think that's where a lot of the rage is coming. People are kind of commenting back and forth. Ego is playing a big uh, issue of this communication between, you know, the government and, and, and media agencies going back and forth. Just my advice, if you're on social media and you're following the news that way, Please read an article before you share it. Um, don't make assumptions. Don't be angry at the person who's posting it. You know, everyone's taking opportunity of expression. Try to have some intelligent situations. But if you're trying to follow this situation, social media is, is your afterthought. That's the reaction to it. That should not be your main source of, of, of where you're going to things. And I'll just add one really good, good um, website. It's called Stat News, S-T-A-T News. That's a news organization that, uh, specializes in science and health news coverage. So all those journalists are trained in science news. So if you're interested in getting COVID information without the politics of it, that's a really great website. Those Michael, I read that every single day. I get their newsletter. You rock. Hey, thank you both. We have to, it's two o'clock and I have to say goodbye to you. You have classes to teach and so forth. Jade Snyder, Mike Parada, thank you. Thanks everybody for joining us for this and for your fabulous questions. Um, Great questions. Thank you everybody. Eden, Stay where's, safe. Where's the free lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Take care.